Well, I was just going to say a few words as a, as a, in terms of uh, introducing the English part of the conference. Um, Rama, Nayong, myself, Estelle, Sosten, all the tea, we are completely buzzing with excitement uh, at the end of the conference in French this morning. The food, the intellectual food that we got was tremendously precious mm -hmm. and um, left us really uh, wanting more. So this afternoon we have amazing presenters as well and we are starting with an excellent one. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for being here. Oh, yeah. I will let, uh, mm, I will let um, Kwame uh, introduce you and lead the session. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I have the honor of presenting to you all Miss Natasha Hawk. Uh, Natasha Hawk is currently a teacher coach working with educators across the Aga Khan Academies in Mombasa, Maputo, Hyderabad, and Dhaka. If I'm mispronouncing some of these names, please let me know. <laughs> Uh, Natasha qualified as a humanities teacher in the UK in 2000 and has since worked in Kenya, Tanzania, the UAE, Bahrain, and the UK across both British and IB curriculum schools. She has been an IB middle years program coordinator. She is passionate about promoting international mindedness, capacity building, and service learning. Natasha has presented and shared ideas at several IB conferences and written articles which have been published by IB blogs, the International Educator, and a chapter in a book on international education. Natasha is the mother to three lovely boys and lively boys as well, and her perspectives on education is constantly evolving with experiences as a student, teacher, school leader, teacher coach, and parent. Natasha holds a master's of science degree in development studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies and a BA in geography from the London School of Economics. So everybody please welcome Natasha as she presents, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so welcome, Caribou, to this session, which is entitled uh, Decolonizing and Indigenizing the Curriculum, Dilemmas, Opportunities, Steps, and um, Resources. I hadn't realized that there would be such a great and detailed introduction already, so I would like you to bear with me. And for the purposes of this presentation, I really just wanted to focus on two things about myself, which can possibly explain why I'm interested and passionate about this topic. So um, the first is that, um, which uh, has been covered, is that I am a third culture adult. I've lived in many countries and I'm bringing up children who are third culture kids. Um, I'm the daughter of, immigrants to the United Kingdom. And so my own educational experience meant that I did not see my own story or my own history reflected in the um, curriculum that I studied. And it's something that I've really thought about as a parent as well with my children who happen to be living in multiple countries, not out of their own choice, but because of my choices, um, how they feel in terms of where they're rooted, um, how they're co connected to their personal histories and what cultures they identify with and what affiliations um, they, they feel. So this is naturally drawn me towards curriculum development. And then the second most important aspect of all my bio, uh, bio data, I suppose, is where I'm working right now. And I'm lucky enough to be working at the Aga Khan Academies. Um, and as uh, has been mentioned, I get to work with teachers across the academies in Mozambique, India, 
and now increasingly in Bangladesh. I am based in Kenya and I have been for the last three years. So what I would like to do today is share a little story about a project that I've been collaborating with um, the teachers that I work with and share some of our uh, the steps in our journey, some of our successes, the resources that we found along the way, and then sort of circle back and think about some of the dilemmas and opportunities that are presented when we're trying to sort of decolonize or indigenize um, a curriculum. So the project I want to speak about is um, how we at the academies decided to work on aligning the curriculum for grade nine and grade 10 in the humanities. So um, the, the question I think we should always start with is why? Why do we want to change the curriculum or uh, why we, do we want to um, look at the curriculum areas? So I think the first thing is always being driven by our mission and vision. So at the academies, the desire is very much to build capacity of young leaders who come back um, and live in their home countries and build strong um, civil societies. Um, and as part of this vision, the Aga Khan Academies already have something called the Aga Khan Curriculum Strands. And this is the idea that in all of our curriculum, there should be an infusion of elements of ethics, pluralism, uh, a look at cultures, a look at the governance and civil society within the context in which we work, and a look at the economics um, for development. The mission and vision attracted me to this role as a teacher coach, um, because essentially I get to work with teachers to try and um, develop this or you know, um, operationalize this vision in terms of the taught, the written and the assessed curriculum. And so um, one of the quotes, and I'm going to try and paraphrase this from the top of my head, um, in uh, 2008, His Highness the Aga Khan gave a speech, uh, the Peterson Lecture to the IB, and he sort of uh, laid down the challenge that what do developing societies um, have to offer to the international baccalaureate, and how can institutions which are rooted in different um, contexts and in, in different cultures and traditions best work together to bridge societies and worlds which are often, um, you know, been often been dis uh, disconnected. And so, you know, it is a tall order. So what does this look like? That's sort of the sort of philosophical reasons for trying to, um, you know, look at our curriculum. But then there's some really practical uh, reasons to go embark on this project. One of which is we have an exchange program. So our grade nine students, well, after COVID, will hopefully restart in person, have an opportunity to spend a, a semester nearly a semester at another academy. So students from Mombasa can spend a semester in Maputo and vice versa and to Hyderabad, et cetera. So if we align the curriculum across those academies, it makes that uh, program easier for the students. The second great reason for doing it was to create an opportunity for teachers to collaborate and bring their voices into the curriculum and also a very practical um, reason, we wanted to cover the IB suggested topics because our students do the e-assessments. So we had some very practical reasons for coming to this project as well. So um, this was a sort of organic pilot project in a way. There had been some um, work done previously on um, aligning the curriculum, but we, when we started this project, we kind of went to the beginning and started with this idea of building rapport. So I want to go through the stages that we went through and then um, a few of our reflections and then some of the dilemmas and opportunities that we've come across. So two of the activities that really helped us with building rapport was um, trying to imagine what at the academies was our vision for a humanities student who had been through our curriculum to actually know. And to do that, as you can see, we had our mission and vision, our sort of guiding Aga Khan strands of governance, civil society, economics for development, pluralism, ethics, culture, 
But what does that actually look like? So in terms of pluralism, how do we encourage our students to understand themselves, understand others, build relationships? Um, how do uh, students reflect on their own cultural context and identity? Can they identify how they are being seen by others and can they build the skills to work together even where there are differences? Um, how well do they understand the consequences of the absence of pluralism within a group or community, you know, when you have a homogenous uh, kind of mindset. Um, thinking about cultures, are we developing intercultural competencies, ethics, are students asking those right questions? So we tried to answer these questions and even in terms of governance and civil society, what does a 16 year old need to know about their country in order to uh, actively participate and uh, advocate and be a leader in that, um, in that society? So that was one really powerful exercise that got teachers um, sharing their vision and seeing, saying exactly what it looked like. Another really powerful exercise, um, actually inspired by uh, a colleague who has joined us here, Alex Holland, who suggested this exercise, which is super powerful as well. And I highly recommend it to anyone trying to come to some consensus, was to get teachers you know, into breakout rooms, because by the time we started this project, we were in COVID. So it wasn't face-to-face -face meetings, but in, in breakout rooms for teachers to think about their own context and imagine what they, they would ideally like their countries to look like in 15 years time, when our current grade nines would be around 30 years old. And I've just taken a screenshot of a very uh, small part of a spreadsheet uh, where we, where what you see um, in the green boxes is what teachers actually said they would like to see in 15 years time. So in the example of Mozambique, the teachers wanted to see more political stability. They wanted to see reconciliation within political parties. They wanted the media to be less censored, more gender Quality. In India, it was more about identity, um, and in Kenya, about urbanization, for example. And um, we map that against our, plural, our um, Aga Khan strands outcomes, um, just to see how we could embed this in the curriculum. And it was a really powerful way for teachers to share their ideas of what was important and what we should absolutely include um, in our curriculum. So that was the beginning of indigenizing um, this uh, pro it, within this project. The second step was obviously our schools already had existing curricula. And this um, next slide is more for um, illustrative purposes. Uh, you, you do not need to try and read the small um, uh, writing, but basically we audited our existing units. And by auditing, we looked at our own, um, you know, because we are IB schools, what concepts are we covering? What global context? What skills are we developing? And then because of our mission and vision, our own strands, how much are we covering those within our units? And are we giving students a chance in their assessments to showcase their own understanding, giving them choice to research and look at things that they're interested in? And so we sort of audited the curriculum and wrote comments and notes and everybody sort of shared um, things that they really wanted to keep, um, things they, felt were less important things they wanted to bring in from that previous brainstorm of, of how they saw their countries in, um, in uh, 15 years time, et cetera. So we built that and that was our stage two, which I think is also really important because schools always have legacy curricula. Um, they're connected to maybe national curriculums and things like that. So it's important to audit exactly what you have, first of all. Next, um, worked with teachers to kind of uh, think about uh, becoming curriculum designers. Um, the demographic of our teachers uh, is that most of our teachers are local, 
from the context within which the schools are in. And oftentimes becoming, being a curriculum designer or designing units is an additional skill to the classroom, the craft of the classroom. So we actually did some um, reading together, collective reading about becoming curriculum designers. And we were really influenced by work of um, Grant uh, Wiggins and Jay McTie about um, understanding by design. So being really intentional about designing a curriculum and what understandings we want our students to um, get. A second thing that we did, again, another screenshot more for illustrative purposes was backward planning, sort of looking at the diploma program or where our students you know, transition from grade nine and 10 and move on to, and looking at what are the concepts and content that's covered there, and then cascading down some of the skills that we wanted students to come in with, some of the ideas or base understandings that they would need to help them be more successful in that process. And I think at this point, teachers were feeling, you know, comfortable. They had um, an idea or they had ideas of what they would want to add to our curriculum. They had ideas about what they would want to remove. They had um, discussed and understood the different um, options that students go on to take. Because oftentimes, I mean, in, in the diploma, I'm a geography teacher, so I'm forever trying to recruit geography geographers. But I, um, through discussions, got to understand the needs of the economics team, the global politics team, the um, historians, et cetera, et cetera. And then also thinking bigger picture, you know, once they leave, once students leave school, what knowledge should they have um, from the curriculum that they have studied? So we took a stab at developing an overview. And uh, this was again, a collective effort um, whereby the teachers worked together and came up with units that they wanted to see. And so this is sort of a summary, um, summary sheet. So if we look a, across grade nine and 10, there are seven units, essentially. Um, the first one looks at equality and understandings of how identity influences power um, in the context of place. And is this essential in addressing the challenges of development and inequality? So that was a really powerful unit in, um, in Mombasa and Maputo. Students looked at the case study of South Africa and apartheid. And in um, Hyderabad, they looked at the case study of the caste system. So whilst there was an overarching common statement of inquiry, again, the um, indigenizing happened by looking at specific case studies. Um, the next unit was a completely brand new unit, which came about through discussion, this desire to have a unit about empires and superpowers. And that decision was quite a powerful one. You'll see from the student um, surveys, which will come in a later slide. Um, it was by far the most popular unit uh, that we found from student surveys. And this really looked at our perspectives on the past, frame our identities and ideologies today. And again, um, there was a framework of resources which looked at the idea of empires from the past, sort of, um, we looked at the Malian empire, we looked at the Mughals, we looked at the, um, you know, different empires from the past, but also focused on 19th century colonization, European colonization. And then again, each academy could um, look at their own context and how colonization had impacted um, those countries. So students found that a really powerful unit. We moved on to conflict and conflict resolution. Um, and this, the interesting thing about this unit um, was that uh, it was an existing unit, but teachers wanted, teachers wanted to broaden it to include different types of conflict. So understanding the causality, causes and consequences of conflict, ensuring fairness in conflict resolution. So again, uh, a lot of the localization happened through case studies that were used. Global governance, um, and then urbanization, we move on in grade 10, 
to consumption and conservation, human resources, and managing economies. And it's the same kind of pattern you see throughout that um, the, the concepts, the key and related concepts, the Aga Khan strands, the inquiry questions that students explore are the same. However, it's uh, the case studies that they look at and the ideas that uh, the content that they explore is different depending on where they are located. So we already had some um, resources from our existing units and we have already also had teachers having some ideas of activities they wanted to do. But the next thing we did was to reach out to some experts. And um, I think this is a step that sometimes when you are in a, a collaboration, you, you um, sort of think that those are the only people you can work with. But I think it's important to sort of open out your horizons and look at connections that you can build. So in the case of two of our units, we um, sought help from a diploma economics teacher to just add a little bit of rigor to those units. And then for the empires and superpowers, a historian wrote it for us. So, um, or helped us co collate resources along with teachers putting in um, some, some additional resources. Another thing that was quite exciting and an interesting thing was we had an alumni student who was um, able to sort of come and look at resources and uh, find some. She was particularly interested in the conflict unit because she remembered that this was one of the um, most memorable in her experience and uh, came and really gave us a critical eye and found some new resources and developed that. So I think you don't have to look too far when you're looking for experts. Additionally, we reached out to, we have the privilege of being in a network, so uh, the Aga Khan Museum, and we were able to have museum visits and use their um, online resources, but these are available to everybody. Um, the Caravan of Gold, I think Estelle has shared, I know in the past, has wonderful resources about the Malian Empire. Um, and then we worked with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture to develop case study material. So that's um, something that was quite powerful in enriching the curriculum. So by this point, we'd got our ideas, we'd collect, collected some resources, and we'd collected some activities, and now it was time for us to teach. But when we were teaching our units, so that was at the beginning of this year, um, all of the academies were at different uh, situations. The academy in Hyderabad was completely online. The academy in Maputo had a sort of hybrid situation where students were coming in part of the time. And the academy in Mombasa had the most face-to-face -face, uh, contact with students. So this, of course, impacted how the units were delivered. But um, we all taught them, which is a success. And we were able to reflect on some of the pivotal um, things that came out of it. And so I think if to summarize, the two most important things that I think um, really came out of it, powerful activities were firstly, this new unit on empires and superpowers. Um, when we surveyed students in grade nine out of the four units that they did, that was their favorite. Um, then, and part of the reason was because it helped them, and we'll see in student comments later on, understand why things are the way they are linked to the other units. And the other was there were opportunities woven into a lot of different units to bring in the students own intergenerational experiences. So I've just thrown in here a couple of um, photographs, uh, the, the headings that say picture of my grandmother and picture of my great grandmother are students who shared digital memory boxes, basically uh, things that they wanted to find out about their own fa um, histories, personal histories. And so this student's great grandmother was involved in the Mau Mau rebellion and, and um, grandmother was involved in um, sort of 
wanting independent, fighting for independence when um, for Kenya. So those were, it was really interesting to hear the student voice. Another one was we have a lot of um, Asian students who have roots in Africa. And so they looked at the racial divide in Uganda and were able to um, explore that um, situation and came up with this infographic about um, Asians in Uganda. And uh, that, that was really interesting. Another thing was students had learned about, um, I want to go back to referring to the empires and superpowers unit. They'd learned about those uh, empires of the past, but when we came to assess them, we gave them a summative which looked at, is China a 21st century empire? So they were applying the concepts they had learned um, from those other case studies to a modern day kind of uh, scenario and they had sources to look at and things like that. So the curriculum was quite rich looking to the past, but also looking to um, the future. So impact, um, reflection, coming on to reflection, the impact of, on students. So this is a collated pie chart. So there are, we, after every unit, we did some student surveys uh, on Google Forms. And uh, I think for teenagers, I think this is a pretty great success that 66, nearly 67% enjoyed the unit, the most units that they were taught. I mean, that's the simplest thing. If you enjoy what you learn, then hopefully it will stay with you. And 28%, 29% uh, felt that they enjoyed parts of it. And then a few of them, you know, didn't really enjoy humanities, but you know, that's the nature of being a teenager, really. You can't please everybody. <laughs> um, uh, so, and then they had questions to answer about, you know, what, what they particularly liked about units, what they wanted to take with them. And these are just some sample comments. Um, this year has been really positive. Uh, it was interesting to see how the legacy of empires are still with us today. Um, from another unit, they really liked the tragedy of the commons and they looked at ethics. This really made us think um, and led to great discussions and debate about how ethical we really were. And this was an activity around um, overfishing and uh, you know what would make you just fish sustainably for example so you know and then other other comments about um, interactive games and things that were um, done within the units reflections of the teachers um, I think reflections in the focus areas for next year um, the the focus for next year is to refine the the units even further. I mean, it was our first year and there were there are some things that definitely need refining um, and continue to collaborate. Um, I recently, for another project, was able to interview a lot of these teachers who um, had worked on this project with me. And the sort of two overwhelming things that came across is at the start of the project, um, be very honest with you sometimes it was really difficult to get the logistics of people you know the time zones and organizing meetings and you know people wanting to prioritize their lessons and 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 work because schools are busy places but as the process has um, gone on um, you see attendance is very high to these collaborative meetings and it was really heartening to see teachers say that they felt uh, that the power of working together, negotiating, discussing, contributing to the curriculum has resulted in many voices and sometimes those hidden or marginalized stories being unearthed. Um, and ultimately, the, they feel that the curriculum they've ended up with is better and richer for all of these different inputs than had they gone down the conventional route of just worked within their grade level teams to develop units. Um, and another thing that it's, uh, as a teacher coach is a personal, um, brings me personal joy is the fact that I think we've got at least the beginnings of a very strong um, professional learning community where teachers have actually met each other. They've built a relationship, albeit virtually, um, and created a tangible outcome. So, you know, if they need help, they don't 
they can look beyond their particular academy or their particular context and um, get that support. So I think those are powerful, powerful reasons for um, embarking on um, such a project. And in our context, yes, the academies are linked because they're all interrelated by being Aga Khan academies, but there I don't see any reason why passionate educators can't get together and create their own learning communities to uh, do something similar or, you know, take some of the positive ideas that um, have been shared so far. So circling back to the opportunities and dilemmas and throughout the process, there've been a number of, of dilemmas and a number of challenges and a number of opportunities. But just to showcase just how um, not straightforward this process is, <laughs> I wanna share an example from relatively recently. Um, I happened to be visiting Mozambique and one of our colleagues there shared um, an issue that was really hitting the news uh, just at the end of the month in May. And this idea that the government had printed and distributed uh, primary school history books, and they had many errors in, in the history book, factual errors, but also sort of um, suggestions like um, one translation um, sort of suggests that, you know, in the colonial period of, um, that there was a period of peace and stability for Africa since Africans ceased being African and became European. And so those kind of statements obviously have huge impacts in, on how students will see themselves, how they see their um, country, how they see their history. And initially the government was very much um, not refusing to sort of um, uh, deal with the uproar that was coming their way. But I think most recently on the 7th of June, I came across uh, an article, so just earlier this week, where they have uh, accepted that they're going to correct these textbooks and they have invited uh, people to make suggestions about uh, corrections in the textbook. So it is a dilemma, right? It's a dilemma about are we ever going to be decolonized, right? It's about decolonizing the mind as well. And it is also an opportunity. So this, this situation has at least um, stimulated or started a really important conversation among educators in um, Mozambique around some of these issues. So I did want to leave a bit of time for discussion. So I'm just going to sort of summarize um, in the end, if I was asked personally for my reflection on this topic, I think in terms of decolonizing our existing curriculum, one of the important things to teach was empires and superpowers. And here I do have to shout out to Alex, because she's been the one who produced most of the wonderful resources that we got to use and um, allowed us to um, also bring in resources from the different contexts where we're working. Um, indigenizing the curriculum, I think uh, the intergenerational pieces are so important because uh, children like mine who find themselves in countries that, uh, you know, not where they may be connected to, or um, uh, students who don't see their stories can can miss out on opportunities to explore that, at, explore those things at a young age. So I think um, building those into the units helps, um, and bringing local case studies, localizing um, the curriculum helps bring it to life. The dilemmas, obviously, they're the one I shared about national curricula, there's similar, similar but different um, experiences in Bangladesh. I'm working with the teachers there, um, a teacher there, and it's a requirement to cover the national curriculum um, of Bangladesh. So it's looking at that and also balancing how our mission and vision of, of creating these self-reflective uh, students who can look at that not unquestioningly, unquestion but actually looking into multiple points of view around that. 
um, opportunities. This is not something that can that has to be restricted to the humanities, but can definitely happen in other subject areas. I know in the academies, uh, the arts are the sort of next subject that's looking at some sort of alignment across um, the academies. And I think um, that will be an interesting process to follow. I think the steps, um, if there's a big takeaway from this, it's that you can't do this on your own. Um, the more voices that you can bring in and the more people who you can bring into the process, I think the richer it is and uh, more nuance that you're able to bring in and share with the students and they're able to get that deeper understanding. Um, resources. Um, resources are a tough one, right? Because often the things that we're trying to unearth are maybe the stories which are lesser known than what we'd find in traditional textbooks or even within the context where we work in the national curricular textbooks and, and things like that. So being creative, opening up. And once you start collecting those resources, you start curating them. And I think sharing those becomes important. So that's really all I wanted to share. And I wanted to leave some time for sort of some discussion and questions and answers. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Natasha, that was amazing. Uh, one thing that I that I keep from from your presentation is uh, st far from straightforward. Sometimes we feel that indigenizing, decolonizing, all of that stuff is just about having diverse people in a room and beam. But the the structuring the collaboration, knowing what you're looking for, mapping the curriculum that takes so much uh, a skill and that's why the Aga Khan Academies need someone like you <laughs> as a as a as a teacher coach now um we are going to take questions from uh uh from the audience from from you any questions you can just write them in the um in the chat and I'll myself or Kwame will pick them up and uh, ask um so Alana, you have your hand up. So yes, please unmute and make sure you remute afterwards. Sorry, I could also write in the chat. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, um, Natasha, this was a really fantastic presentation and it's great to see you again. Um, yes. Yeah, so I have a couple questions and I think I saw a similar question in the chat about resistance. To, so the people that were not included in the planning process, I would love to know kind of um, how much resistance they had or they you experienced in actually implementing that. Because I guess okay. within the community itself, it makes sense. And then afterwards, it must be harder. Yes, so I'd say, if I'm honest, we made a real effort to include every single teacher who taught was teaching grade nine and 10. So it's been a you know in each this this process has gone over 15 months so to a large extent um they were all on board we did face some resistance when the curriculum was presented to say um the principal or the dean of studies who felt well maybe there's not enough history in some units or it's becoming too economics -y or so we did field some resistance there and then it was a, an issue of negotiation and I think what helped us there is that we really had the backing of the leadership so the leadership believed in this project and they gave us the time they had backed us with the ideas of the reasons why this was happening and they also um, put resources behind it right by um, giving us the time and I got to recently visit um, Maputo and and see how um, the curriculum was being implemented there. So I think yes, you will face resistance. There will be people who criticize and say, oh, you know, but it, why did you change this or why did you not change that? But I think if you can bring uh, the majority with you, that's really powerful. And if you have some support from leadership, that that helps with that. All right, thank you.
Thank you so much. And yes, yes, yes. So much is happening within the chat. I invite everybody to check it out. Sharon is, uh, is saying it's always down to the leadership, obviously. Leaders have a huge responsibility. If they don't consider this important, it will not happen. We have also um, uh, greetings from, um, uh, from many people including Sarah Poos from Mini PD. Thank you. This is one of our sponsors as well. Um, and I'm just looking for the next question, which was from Katharina. Um, how would you balance giving students opportunities to explore their own culture's history versus learning about the local context in which they're attending school? So a question for the international education context. Yeah, so again, this this was something that we negotiated. So uh, I think the, the level of planning had um, really helped us here. So if you remember in the overview, we had decided what our um, key understandings would be through the inquiry questions. Then we um, had identified how long we would have to teach each unit. And within the units, some units, um, for example, in the empires and superpowers, they were planned almost lesson by lesson um, with uh, opportunities for teachers to bring in their own resources and their suggestions. They weren't, you did not have to follow every single thing that was in the um, planned document, but it at least gave you a starting point. And then, you know, each uh, department then had to implement, decide which lessons they wanted to go with and identify where there were those opportunities to bring in um, those intercultural or intergenerational explorations. I have to say uh, the balance was that we were actually more focused on the local curriculum and there were um, occasional opportunities, more formative opportunities when, you know, go home and ask someone or you know find out about this or that the intergenerational uh, opportunities so they were built into the sort of classroom activities or homework activities um so i'm not sure if i've answered your question um but i think it is uh, always a negotiation uh, be between the teaching team about uh, giving those op opportunities. But I think it is really important that they understand the local context in which they're living and attending school. Because sometimes, um, you know, I have met students or I know students who feel disconnected from where they're going to school because they live in a bubble, right? Sort of an expatriate bubble or um, all their friends, they're going to go off back to their home countries. So they don't necessarily know what's happening in the um, local context. But I think that's a mistake because to be able to really enrich your experience of having lived abroad, you need to know what's happening in that um, environment and in that place. So I think as teachers, we need to make sure our students have an idea of what's going on within the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maite is agreeing with you by, by uh, um, saying how sad it is that students don't know their own stories as well. And Yasmin wanted to know, that will be our last question, uh, to wanted you to elaborate on, on, on where you found the time. Were we, uh, was it during pet days, during, you know, weekends? Where did you find the time to do all this wonderful work? So um, time was probably the biggest issue, finding the time. So we, um, and this is where the leadership really helped us. Um, so we were able to block out um, 90 minute or two hour sessions sort of in the beginning of the year um, and in the middle and then towards the end of the year and in between times we were able to organize sort of um, workshops that might be just for the grade nine teachers or just for the grade 10 teachers so uh, this process definitely takes time um, and I think the, everything that I've presented has I mean we started in um, I want to say December 2020. So it's taken almost close to 18 months um, for this all to happen. So it, it's, it's not a quick process. It is a slow process. And uh, the time has been 
uh, those teachers have got time off timetable to attend these meetings and participate. Oh, wow, we, <laughs> we circle back to leadership. <laughs> to leadership, this is not a, a struggle that you can have as a teacher on your own or as a group of, 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 of teacher activists. You can only go so far. You need the support of the leadership. You need all the resources, the time, the people, and sometimes, yes, the money. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natasha. We appreciate you. Thank you. And that was Thank a you. wonderful presentation that I want to close by also thanking, thanking uh, Kwame for introducing you and thanking one of our collaborators, IDIJ Continuum, uh, working with ILOC. I know that some of you are here, we see you, we appreciate you, and we love the work that you are doing. Right now, uh, we will take five, a five minute break before the next presentation by Claire McMinn.